for Good Friday, and we're going to take a look at two passages of scripture. I want to talk about, in all of this, the moment that everything changed. First, we're going to take a look at Matthew 27. It's the account of the death of Jesus on the cross. And then we're going to take a look at Colossians chapter 2. It's almost like a split screen. You know, it's, it's like the impact and then the so what factor for us. Because what's interesting about Good Friday, which is today, which is the day that we remember the death of Jesus, is that we're simultaneously mourning what happened, which was horrible, but we're also celebrating the outcome of it, that God's sovereign plan was to supersede what the enemy intended to accomplish for his own purposes. So we don't have to hide our emotions. They're conflicted, and rightly so, that we would see that our sin and, and this broken world, it's awful, right? But that God, that God sent his son to die, but that we're also simultaneously rejoicing in the fact that God so loved us, so loved us, that Jesus was willing to die. And in those two truths, there is this tension. So two passages. One's a story. You've heard it before. Let it, let it hit you anew. And the second reading is the outcome, the results, if you will, of the cross, results of the crucifixion. Matthew 27, verses 50 through to 56. Everything changed because of the cross. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And then, jumping forward to the book of Colossians, Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sin and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled and charge of, your, of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us this Good Friday to properly absorb just what wonderful things, what terrible but wonderful things took place on this long-awaited day of salvation, that long-foretold day of redemption. You took your time. You didn't rush. It seemed to those of us on this planet that you had forgotten about us. But then at the perfect time, at the right time, in the fullness of time, you sent forth your son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us from the law by becoming a curse for us. And that is what you did. You hung on the cross for us to save us and to redeem us, to redeem this broken world. And so in the midst of this COVID-19 crisis, we, we look to the cross our eyes are on you and we have reason to be expectant of you to do great things, not only in this moment, but in every moment. So we trust you. We believe in you. And we ask for you to even now, in this moment, do miraculous things in our hearts and lives. And we ask this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. You know, it feels a little bit like everything has changed in our culture. Experts are saying that even when this is all over, that we should probably, as a country, stop shaking hands. They're saying that instead of shaking hands, perhaps we could do a small bow, right? 
Um, and, and just think about how things in our culture will change without a handshake. It's probably for the best. You know, we can't shake hands. KFC has pulled their finger licking good campaign, blowing candles out on a birthday cake. That's always been really gross. But when, when we do come out of this, and we will, it's going to be completely different. And to some extent, our world has changed. There has been an undeniable impact from this. I mean, just think about the fact that at the time of preaching this message, the death toll in Canada alone is over 22,000. 2.6 million worldwide. And all of us, to some extent, have lost something. But some have lost very significant things. And there's no getting back to normal for anybody who's lost someone. And so we won't get over this. We will get through this and God will bring us to the other side to rich reward and blessing that, the, that, that God intends for us if we keep our eyes fixed on him in the midst of this. But things have changed. But truly for us, for followers of Jesus, the cross is the moment when everything changed. Everything changed on the cross. And I, I want to show you three ways, three ways that that's true. The first thing is that your past has changed. It's almost like one of those time travel movies. You know what I'm talking about? When they have to rush back to change something in the past. And then, then as they change the past, the impact is felt in the future. And once it's done, just it's almost like this ripple effect. You know, all the photos have changed. So this impact on the cross, as you believe in it today, when your faith intersects with what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, your past is changed. Not just the past when Jesus died, but the reality of the living Lord and what he did on the cross that day. As you touch him with your faith, it extends into your past, your past issues. So what does that mean? It means this, that Jesus' payment was accepted on behalf of your sins. His payment for your sins. That's what Matthew tells us. This is uh, this is this is such a colossal event that there there is shaking of the ground, right? It's almost like the fabric of all things are being altered because Jesus hung on the cross. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, all your sins were laid upon him. So here's Jesus hanging there. He hadn't done anything wrong, and yet he was dying. Not for anything he did wrong. He was dying for what we did wrong. And there's no confusion about who killed him. I mean, there's this big push from, from the Jews to get it done. Pilate wanted to wash his hands of it. So, so who, who is responsible for Jesus' death? He died praying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Whose fault was it? Yes, it was Rome, the Romans' fault. Yes, it was Pilate. Yes, it was the Jewish leaders. Yes, it was you. And yes, it was me. We killed Jesus. It was my sin that caused Christ to come and to hang on, on that cross. That's what he was doing. He was paying for our sins. And the moment you believe in Jesus, his payment that was made, his rescue, his blood money, this righteous, innocent man who, who was also God dying, the moment you believe your past is completely altered. So today, if you've trusted Jesus, your past is different than it was while you were doing the deeds in your life. Everything you've ever done has been forgiven. That's what Colossians is saying. It's saying that he died. This is verse 13. He forgave. He forgave us all our sins. Another version reads, he canceled the written code. What code? Well, there are two things. 
it's number one, the code of our conscience. All of us are aware when we do things that are wrong. We, we know that. All of us deep down inside of us, in our hearts, we know when we've done something that separates us from God. We know to do better. Our own conscience it, it accuses us, but there's more. There's God's word. God has spoken through his word and specifically in the Old Testament, he revealed, you know, thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not lie. And thou shalt not commit adultery. All of these things he, he codified a written code. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins must surely die. And the Bible says, as he died, the moment he breathed his last, the Bible says he did so on a cross that had a bill of indebtedness nailed to it, a written code nailed to it. Now, the cool thing about this is that the Greek word that's used here means a handwritten IOU. You know, when you buy something and you can't afford it or, or you know, you say, well, I'll pay you later. I'll set up some sort of payment plan. You know, you, you do a handshake. Well, we can't do that right now. So it's actually a, a written a written thing. You know, I promise to pay you back when I can on this particular schedule. If I gave you an IOU that I signed, you could now, you now have leverage over me, right? And if I don't meet the terms, if I don't pay you back, then, then you can, of course, act on it in a legal way because I promised to do something and I have not done it. Well, the Bible says that we have a note of indebtedness, an IOU to God, because we know what's right and he revealed to us what's right. And we all have sinned. We've all fallen short of his glory. We've all separated ourselves from him. That's why there's sin in the world. God, however, is so good that God has a plan to redeem the dark things and eventually to vanquish them altogether. And it happened and it was made possible because of what Christ did on the cross. And Jesus died with an IOU, with your signature nailed above his head. That he, the great king of the Jews, died for us, died as though he were us. And because that's true, verse 14 says in, in another translation, he has utterly wiped out the damning evidence of broken laws and commandments, which always hung over our heads. And he completely annulled it by nailing it over his own head on the cross. Because of those things that we've all done that caused us to fall short, he was willing to have it nailed above his head. That means, that means this, that he didn't just die for you. He died as though he were you before God's sight. And that's why the Bible says God turned his face away from his son. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, he was being treated like you and I deserve to be treated. So God could treat us like Jesus deserves to be treated. But consequently, once we've accepted that payment, then from that moment forward, every wrong thing we've ever done has been forgiven. Your past is completely changed. It's completely altered. Because of the cross, everything about your whole life up to this point has been altered. And God can't even see those things that you've done that you wish that you could forget. Those sins were paid for in full. We can't understand that kind of love. We can't explain that kind of love. But, but what can we do? 
we can accept that kind of love. We can lean in to that kind of love and be completely transformed down to every cell in our bodies by that kind of love because what he did once and for all on the cross. The second thing that changed is your future. When you trust Christ, not only is your past altered, your future is completely opened up. Your future is completely changed. In fact, the text speaks of this resurrection power and it's hinted at this idea of his life in you. Well, what, what life is that? It's the resurrection life. His action of dying on the cross was first, was the first in a series of dominoes that will continue to be knocked down over all eternity. Because of Jesus and his blood on the cross for you and me, we have the promise of life after death. There is eternal life for you. So that right there should give you peace. So our fear of death should dissolve into basically nothingness. In fact, and this is what so many people believe that, that David was, was getting at when he was talking, uh, when he was in, in Psalm 23, verse 4, about the shadow. I will not fear, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Many commentators believe that David was actually referring to the Passover, to the Exodus, to, to Moses' uh, rod and the Red Sea parting, that because of the power of God demonstrated through Moses' rod, the water had to part. And David is saying what you should be able to say confidently today on this Good Friday is I am not afraid of this plague or any other. My life is in God's hands and I'm going to take all the wise steps. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to socially distance. I'm going to get vaccinated because I, because I love and I, and I want to serve the city and I want to give people, I want to give healing and alleviation. I want to, I want to put my needs behind the needs of other people. Death cannot touch you. We will not fear. Our future has changed. Beloveds, because of the cross, everything changed. Our past, our future, leaving only our present. The third and final thing that I want to show you that has changed because of the cross and that makes this truly a good Friday is the fact that our present has changed too. I want you to understand that God didn't just send Jesus to die to save you from something or to something, but for something. If, if God wanted to just save us and to get us to heaven, then, then he could have loaded us up on a big you know, bus the moment that we believed in God and just send us on up, right? But, but we're here for something. If you are alive today, if there is breath in your lungs today, if you are a Jesus person today, he has you on this earth for a purpose, for a reason. He has a plan. Everything shifted when Jesus died on that cross with regards to your present because now he has a plan to use you to touch and to love and to, to serve and to impact all kinds of people. The text that we read from, uh, from Matthew, says that the veil was torn top to bottom. Not bottom to top, as though we earned uh, our way up, but top to bottom because God saw what Jesus did and was able to tear open what separated us to invite us into his presence. The reason I think this is key is that when you remember 
your present, you know, right now, God's plan for you to use you, to bless you, to, to bless others through you. It's a lot of weight on you. And so you need to know, we need to remember, we have access to God for help at any time. You have access to God, to God's presence, to receive the help that you need to do all that God has called you to do because it is a big mission. And so here we are in these times like never before with opportunity to reach out, to show love, to to get behind the kingdom of God coming and being felt on this earth as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19, this is the message. Paul puts it this way. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We have been called and born and chosen for such a moment as this. It is not a mistake that we are living and we are alive in these historic times. And it is for us to let the world know that there is life, that there is forgiveness, that there is peace, that there is a relationship with God that can change everything for them. God did it all on the cross, but the delivery of that news, he's left to you and me. But we don't do any of it alone because of Jesus. We have access to God. There is no veil. In the ancient Jewish temple, a large veil blocked access to the Holy of Holies, where the presence of God dwelled. It was a constant reminder that sin separated us from God. Nobody was allowed in except for the high priest, and then only once a year. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest would pass through the veil to offer a sacrifice for the sins of Israel. This continued for generations because the sacrifice could never be good enough. Fortunately, it was just a foreshadowing of what was to come. 2,000 years ago, something changed. A new sacrifice was offered, a perfect sacrifice. One final sacrifice for all of time. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. He paid the ultimate price so that the sins of all men could be forgiven. At the moment of his death, the large veil in the temple, the very thing that represented centuries of separation from God, was torn. Torn in two from the top down, showing that this era of separation was over. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the Holy of Holies once and for all time and secured our redemption forever.